Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of Miso, Traditional Flavors with Modern Application. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you four great speakers, chef and author Hiroko Shimbo, author and educator Kirsten Shockey, chef Kyle Connaughton, and today's moderator and our TFA advisory board member, chef Robert Donnie. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them. We would also like to thank today's sponsor, Miso Master Organic Miso, traditionally handcrafted and naturally fermented miso made using traditional Japanese techniques, techniques in Western North Carolina for over 40 years. All right, Robert, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Amelia. And thank you to the Fermentation Association for hosting today's webinar. It's incredible to see this list of where everyone is from. Um, um, I consider myself a curator of cultures and I'm the co-founder of Flavor360 Software, a tool for cultural research and food and beverage R&D. Today, my role as an advisory board is to moderate this really impressive group that will lead you through the traditional flavors of miso and showcasing modern applications. So let me begin with a brief introduction to each one of them, and then we'll dive into those miso stories. So first up today is going to be my longtime friend and Japanese cuisine authority, Hiroko Shimbo. I believe Hiroko and I met about 22 years ago when I was teaching at the CIA in New York. And frankly, I needed help learning to teach about the cuisines of Japan and the culture in the cuisines of Asia course. So I reached out. And since then, Hiroko has written three award-winning books. She's been a chef instructor, at respected culinary schools all over the world. She's a consulting chef uh, to diverse food service companies, um, including manufacturers. And her next focus is to create and conduct tours in Japan. Kyushu is one focus. And um, to really look at the history, the food culture, the arts and crafts. So that's Hiroko, and she'll tell you a little bit more about herself. The next presenter is going to be Kirsten Shockey. Now, Kirsten um, uh, of Ferment Works, which is a collaboration with her husband, uh, Christopher, they've authored four books um, on fermentation, the big book of cider making, fiery ferments, fermented vegetables, and a recent one that I just got and I can't wait to start making, miso, tempeh, natto, and other tasty ferments. They have an incredible online fermentation school. And uh, she's also on the advisory board of the TFA and I'm honored to get to know her a little bit better today. Now, the third and final round will be led by Kyle Kanani. Now, who I first met 25 years ago when he was actually a student in my Garmage class when I was teaching at the Southern California School of Culinary Arts in, uh, in Los Angeles. Now, now he's a three-star Michelin chef the owner of Single Thread up in Hillsborough, Northern California. And he got there um, by um, to be one of the top chefs in the world, frankly, of working his way through LA restaurants like AOC and Luke and Hamasushi. Then he moved to Japan, right? And worked with Michelle Bra and, and other local places. By 2006, he was the head R&D chef of the Fat Duck in London, helped write the culinary science program at the CIA, and also co-authored a book on Donabi cookery, which he showcases at Single Thread. Um, and I fortunately had an incredible dining experience there, I guess the year before last, and stayed at the inn. So when we can get to traveling again, that's a place to go. Well, uh, today isn't about me or what I know about miso, because this panel knows just a tremendous amount. So we have such a talented group that you all want to hear from. That's why you signed on here. Uh, so we're going to begin with Hiroko and begin our flavorful miso journey. Hiroko, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Hiroko Shinbo. That's it. <laughs> thank you, Robert, for the introduction. And thank you, the Fermentation Association, for having us today here. Today, I will talk about the Japanese culinary culture of miso, its variety, and the dishes using miso that are both traditional and innovative. So, let me share with you one story, uh, which 
described the FPG large trade with a culture in Japan. Uh, Japanese uh, marrying, uh, born and raised in Tokyo, marrying a person from Kyoto Prefecture. Uh, we will often make this comment on his our Mr. Tsu. Wow, this is completely, completely brand flavor from the which I grew up with. It's uh, unique, but I love it. If the partner doesn't like it, the marriage is in trouble. So Japan is a long and narrow archipelago stretching from 20 degree to 45 degree north latitude. 122 degree to 153 degree east longitude. This extended geography with associated climate variations contributes to creating regionally unique food culture. So, miso in Japan, every region has different flavors, sweetness, aroma, degree of salted or saltiness, production processes different. Materials are used so different. It's so fun and cherished. Uh, okay, so uh, let me quickly today introduce you three out of 16 representative miso varieties in Japan. And I will show you how they are used and enjoy it. So now, please get rid of stereotype idea about miso, uh, some people say, oh no, that's salty, not so flavorful, uh, thin miso soup. Okay, so I will switch the uh, video to here. Let me get back to the go back, go to my, okay, wait, wait. <laughs> um, so... So Robert, how to get to, <laughs> to my name? My name, uh, this treatment. Okay, oh, oh, I know. Sorry, sorry. No, do you see my? Yeah, we can see that, Hiroko. Wait. Send, Sendai Miso. Okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, now. So, uh, start with Sendai Miso. Sendai Miso. This is a salty red type miso made in Miyagi Prefecture in the north of Japan, facing the Pacific Ocean. This miso has been systematically produced under the Shiro Road since the 16th century. The production of miso uses more soybeans than other red type of miso, and it's aged for two years before consumption. So this miso is rich in umami with notable lactic acid flavor. A popular traditional dish made with this miso is called imoni. Here imoni. Imo means sato imo taro. With vegetables and pork are cooked together in a same pot and flavored with sendai miso. This is with a bowl of rice, very rich and satisfying soup serves as a full meal and at the same time it provides good nutritional value, complete essential amino acids, minerals, vitamins, and carbohydrates. Every, day, uh, every fall, local people hold events called Imoni uh, Soup Get Together Gathering. Organizers set up the cooking equipment on the riverbed, cook the stew, and serve to people who come to the event, friend, family, even the tourists. The tradition involved in preparing and enjoying this dish, Imoni, is well preserved in the region. Okay, and here is another dish. This is a 300 years uh, favorite in the region. It's called shisomaki. And the shisomaki in which the miso is, here, here you go. 
The miso is mixed with flour, oil, sugar, nuts, sesame seed, and rolled up in shiso leaf. And the day we fry, today I skillet cook it. The uh, shiso becomes crispy, shiso, and it's delicious. It goes well a glass of wine, glass of sake from the region, or even a cognac. So here, now I have done a little bit uh, more destruction of this shitomaki. The same ingredients are sandwiched in kyodo and baked. And I use more nuts. This is just a great savory snack. Uh, which you can enjoy with any beverage. Okay, so that's the Sendai miso from the north. And then now I have yeah, Saikyo miso coming from Kyoto Prefecture. And the Saikyo miso, uh, this is uh, sweet, more koji rice. It's used in the production. So resulting in making a miso naturally sweet. Sometimes syrup made from rice, barley, or corn is added, making the texture of the miso a bit sticky or too sweet. I don't like this version. Fermentation is short, resulting in lighter color, as you see. Kaikyo miso is ideal for using famously elegant and refined Kyoto cuisine that emphasizes the natural flavor of each ingredient in the prepared dishes. Taiko miso has been used to marinate fish, a 200 year old technique. The former imperial capital of Kyoto is far from the sea, so preserving fish in miso began naturally. Nobu Matsuhisa of American restaurant fame served this dish in late 1980s in the US and it instantly became popular throughout the country at the Japanese restaurant. The American version of this dish is however a bit too, too sweet for my taste. The chefs put just too much sugar in it. It's like eating a fish candy. Okay, so here this is a famous New Year's soup enjoyed by the local people in Kyoto people at the beginning of every year. The soup has a large amount of saikyo miso and has a texture, it's uh, like a thick cottage-like texture. Uh, the, uh, this uh, is, uh, uh, it's sweet uh, due to the miso content. Half cup of dashi has three tablespoons white sweet miso. So usually a little bit of mustard paste is added to cut the sweetness of this sweet soup. Enjoying this New Year's soup continue as an important Kyoto tradition to this day. So today chefs and cooks are using Taikyo miso, which is fair in color and uh, a lighter color and a sweet taste. And here is my version. I mixed uh, chefs and cooks in, in Japan is doing this. Uh, mix white sweet miso with uh, soy milk. Uh, some people add cheese or something, but this is a simple situ. Uh, wonderful Vegetarian uh, night, uh, wonderful stew. So, Again, this is the stew, and here there's one more I can show you. And this recipe is actually in my Hiroko's American kitchen. Sweet miso sauce, lemon juice, kutuwasada juice, olive oil, yogurt, everything is mixed. And this is licking delicious. And you can use as a salt uh, dressing or salt uh, with grilled salmon or you can use as a dip. So white miso has lots of very grand applications. Okay, so from Kyoto. Then we will move to Mugi miso. Mugi miso comes from 
huge region, the southernmost large island of Japan. And more soybeans are used. Uh, to, uh, no, 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 sorry. Mugi miso is made with barley, barley miso, barley and the soybeans. And mugi miso has completely different flavor and aroma characteristics. It has no sweet and features coarse aroma. I love this miso. This is my miso to go. Okay, so the dish uh, the normal people make traditionally is called patmajiru. Uh, this is what size the similar soup I introduced it at the beginning. So for this dish, variety of vegetables, including tatsumaimo or and the chicken goes into this uh, soup. And the first the chicken and the vegetables are sauteed in oil. This technique shows the strong influence of Chinese and Portuguese cuisine brought by those people to church many hundreds of years ago. Then that is added to finish the cooking and finally the dish is flavored with mugi mito. And this soup remains a regional favorite today. And also served that as school lunch across the country. Not too salty, not too sweet mugi miso uh, can be used as marinade, uh, stewing, or stir frying. Or here today, I made a pizza. And here is the mugi miso sauce mixed with a little tomato sauce. Miso and the tomato are both uh, umami powerhouse. So this be slightly uh, frightening to someone who never tasted a miso pizza. It's actually delicious, delicious. So that's the uh, free miso I explained. I just want to quick. I have explained that miso and miso culture in Japan is diverse and wonderful. While traditional miso dishes in each region remain strong and popular, chefs and the cooks are exploring more ways to use this healthy uh, food. Okay, let me come back to this screen. Okay, so lastly, I wanna add one important information about the selection of miso. Not all the miso so that the food stores are made equally or worth purchasing. Some brand of miso start with used interior materials and processed by shortened uh, factory method. This kind of miso usually solarized or cheap treated or alcohol is added to stop the fermentation. So we can't expect good flavor nor nutritional value in this type of miso. So here, what I use, uh, I love this uh, miso, plus I use my homemade miso. So these two miso, uh, actually I visited this company and they use organic ingredients, uh, the right type of soybeans made cause rice fermentation is 100% artisanal uh, traditional way. So, and these are not heat treated. So you can expect beneficial uh, uh, benefit to our health, helps digestion and increase beneficial bacteria in our guts. So lastly, no matter how delicious and uh, healthy miso is, don't overconsume it. The high salt content of miso are useful moderation, uh, except young sweet miso. So enjoy it a little bit at a time on a regular basis. And actually I am uh, doing the Zoom class for, uh, to make uh, miso. Please visit hirobotskitchen.com.
and let make good, healthy, delicious miso. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you, Hiroko. You cooked so much food. I wish I was there to eat it. That was a yeah. beautiful display. Uh, this uh, <laughs> tonight and tomorrow's. <laughs> It's wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing your, your passion and knowledge on, on miso. You know, the Sendai, the Saikyo, the Mugi miso. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions that we'll get to at the end if we have time. Uh, the one question I'd like to just bring up quickly is inside the Shisomaki, the roll, yeah. what was inside there? A couple of people asked about that. So that's the Sendai miso, flour, oil, nuts, seven seeds. They are just uh, mixed and form into a cake and rolled up. It's Got it. great. I love it. Looks really good. Thank you, Hiroko. Uh, I think we're gonna move on to our next presenter and hang out as long as you can. We're gonna move to Kirsten. And Kirsten, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're doing in your teaching kitchen there. Uh, you've taught a lot of people to, to cook, to make miso, to make all sorts of ferments. So why don't you show us something online today? We're gonna to need to get your video back. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Just reach. It's all you. <laughs> and, let's see. I can't see myself. Am I on? Yes. You're awesome. good. All right. Welcome everybody. Um, like uh, Robert said, I am Kirsten Shockey, and I write books and teach people all about ferments um, right now that's online through our little school called the fermentation school.com and yeah this is um, my teaching kitchen and so my part of this talk is to answer the question what is miso by by going inside by going lower or not lower but in into the miso so i think of it as this beautiful collaboration of microbes and enzymes and, and time and all of this acting upon um, grains and, and legumes. And it creates something that's, that's super delicious that's in a lot of ways more than the sum of its parts, right? And that's, that's with a lot of cooking, but miso is kind of this magical, just, I, I think of it as a top level ferment because it's got, everybody's involved, all the microbes. So I'm gonna back up a little and explain sort of, I'm talking quickly because we don't have a lot of time, but I wanna explain sort of what's going on, what's creating the miso. Um, we're focusing today on Japanese miso, but I do wanna say that there are traditional bean ferments uh, throughout Asia, these pastes and, and they're wonderful. And they all, you know, have variations on this theme and are regionally um, created, you know, from what those ingredients are. So let's start with koji. Koji is, I like to think of it as the, the engine that, that powers the miso, that, that gets it going. And what koji is, is aspergillus rhizae. It is a filamentous fungus or a mold, if you will. And it is grown on a substrate. Now, traditionally, like the misos that you just saw, um, I have some misos in front of me too. It's um, often on rice, but in Japan, that could, depending on the region, it could be um, barley, it could be sweet potato, and that, that then becomes you know, an alcoholic beverage. So, Aspergillus oryzae doesn't really care what you grow it on. Um, it's got a very traditional um, application, but it's been discovered, so to speak, even though humans domesticated it thousands of years ago by the rest of the world. I don't know why it took the rest of the world so long to sort of discover this beguiling magic of this, of this domesticated mold. But so here we are. And so let's just, Think about how, what happens when koji grows on a substrate. And I'm going to kind of go in and out of traditional applications versus non-traditional applications. Um, the first thing that happens once you inoculate your substrate, let's just say rice, is that the koji lays down a set of enzymes. It lays down enzymes and as it starts to, to grow and metabolize, it's once it's 
feeding itself. That's why it's laying down those enzymes. It needs to break up the parts that are in those grains or legumes or fill in the blank substrate. So in order to feed itself, well in doing so, we get um, amylase, protease and lipase. And these enzymes are the superpower because what happens is the amylase gets in there and it takes those starches and it breaks them up. I like to think of it as little scissors just snipping away at these larger molecules and making them into their smaller parts. Um, in this case, it's the simple sugars. Now, fermentation is driven by sugar. Um, like all the microbes that ferment, if you look into them, they're actually after the sugar, right? The yeast wants to make the sugar into alcohol in a lactic ferment. It's converting those vegetable sugars, those simple sugars into um, acid. And so it's really important with a grain to be able to get into the grain so that the fermenting microbes can get in there and break it down. Um, in the West, we figured out malting for beer, right? It's sprouting, it's a way to get those enzymes going in those grains in order to get at those sugars to then be able to make a brew. Um, so then we also have protease. And protease is again, enzyme, it's gonna take those larger protein molecules that don't have a lot of flavor that aren't really accessible to our bodies and break them apart. And we're gonna get all kinds of amino acids, including um, glutamic acid, which is you know, the one responsible for the umami that we taste in miso and many other things. And so that's really important, both on the level of flavor. Now we're gonna get those flavors in. We're also gonna get those amino acids that are so important to our system. So. With miso, you've got all these actions that are breaking down these foods that we can't digest very well ourselves, but once it's all done, they, they're a superfood. Um, the last one is lipase, and lipase is gonna get in there and break down those fats into fatty acids, and you're also gonna get some esters, so some aromas. So that is kind of the quick version in a nutshell of what koji is doing. So we grow koji on our substrate. Like I said, we're gonna talk rice today in order to harvest those enzymes. Now we're gonna take koji and we're gonna mix it with a lagoon. Um, often it's soy in Asia, but different regions also use different beans like maybe azuki beans or, um, my mind's going blank, but anyway. The point is we're putting our, our koji and our protein together. And with a little bit of salt and some thyme, then we're gonna get a miso or a paste, a tasty paste. So just kind of, I'm gonna jump off into that for just a second. So when I think of traditional recipes that are very Japanese in their nature, then you know I think of them as misos, otherwise, I think the rest of the world that is, is kind of using the magic of koji and, and redefining what it's capable of, there's a lot of names coming out, tasty pastes or amino pastes or, or whatever. And, and these are using all kinds of substrates, right? We can, we can apply those same rules. We can use koji for other beans. Um, I've got some black beans here, and this one hasn't been mashed up at all. And you can actually see the rice and the koji, excuse me, the rice and the beans. This one's been fermenting probably for about a year or so. Um, but it goes beyond beans. People are making miso out of everything. There's something called miso now, which is using using meat. Um, I, I tasted one that uh, Jeremy Lansky did at the larder with heart and it was, it was amazing. Um, so again, it's just the chemicals and the enzymes and, and all that. So once you discover the world of miso and you can go down so many paths, which I think is, is super fascinating. So back to what's going on when we mix these two things together. So I'm gonna kind of 
not repeat, but you're going to get to see again sort of that concept of these different types of mesos. So when you have, because it's really just, um, I think of it as like three ingredients and then, and then two controllers. So our ingredients are koji on something, a protein, salt, and then our controllers are time and temperature. And you mix all that up and, and you get miso and amazing variations. So for example, these are both um, soy misos. They're exactly the same soy miso, same amount of koji protein and salt. The difference here is time. This one is much younger. You can see it's still light. And this one is older and it's heading, heading into that darker, darker world. Now, a hacho miso is really wonderful and it's, it's kind of on the longest, darkest end, but let's back up a second. So for the sweet misos, the white misos, the light misos, what you're doing is you're using more koji, less protein, less salt, and less thyme. And then you're gonna get these mellow misos, you're gonna get these light flavors. Um, and then the longer you take it, the more they're gonna darken and deepen. But also you can, you can kind of front load that on the other end. So if you're gonna make a hacho miso, you know you're gonna put you know five, six, 10 years into this project. What you're gonna do is you're actually gonna avoid the, the rice altogether. You're gonna grow it purely on the soybeans themselves. So it's gonna be all, all soybean. That's where you're gonna get these deep earthy flavors, but you still need that koji to kind of break them up. And so that is on the other extreme. That's our dark, darkest miso. It's the koji is grown straight on the bean. There's no rice. So lots of protein, more salt, more time, right? Okay, so then you've got everything in between and you play with that, right? So if you want a medium miso, it might be equal amounts of koji and protein and less salt than the hacho, more salt than the light rice type. And you're gonna get, you know, more like what we think of as these medium aged misos. Now red miso, um, I have some of that here and it is, a little bit different in that you're not using the, um, the same type of Aspergillus or Rhizae to, to get that. So that one's a little different, but it is also more of a medium aged me, so it's not as young. Um, and I have another one here that's kind of medium in between, and this is one I made also in this vat. Um, I've got this here today because it is um, how I make our batches of meats, our long aged batches of miso. Um, when I filled it, it was up to here. And I think now it's, it's down to here. So we've got that time working on that. We've got evaporation working on that. It's distilling those flavors. Um, and so these are all the things that are working on the miso. Now, you know, I also mentioned temperature. So temperature is another controller. Traditionally, these bean pastes were made in the fall. They were made when that harvest came in and the koji was made with the fresh rice and the miso was made with the fresh beans. And those first few weeks or months of the miso, the temperatures were still warm. It was fall, but it was getting cooler. So that fermentation had a chance to get going and then it would kind of slow down as it went into the winter and then waking up again in the spring. And why that's kind of fun to understand is because you can, you can play around with temperature. If you need to speed up a fermentation, you're gonna warm it up. If you need to slow it down, you're gonna make sure that it's, it's cool. And I think there were a number of questions in, the, in our pre-questions about, you know, how do I get not vinegar flavors, or I think there was alcoholic. All of this has to do with 
sort of how this miso is put together and how it's been fermented. So those alcoholic or vinegar flavors can come from a miso that's too wet. When you're making it, you want it kind of a nice paste consistency. If it's too wet, those yeasts are gonna get control. Remember in the beginning, I said it's this wonderful collaboration of these microbes um, and they're all trying to balance it out and they are collaborating, but really they're all out for themselves, right? So if, if the um, mash is a bit wet, then the yeasts are gonna have a better time or maybe the lactic acid. If you don't have enough salt, you're gonna get these sour flavors that are a little more funky than you're looking for um, because the salt isn't helping can keep everybody in control. So um, that's, that's a lot of information I know. Um, and I know I also wanna talk just quickly a little bit about um, what's going on then with all these microbes and our guts and the health benefits and probiotics versus not. So we've got these wonderful misos. Um, it's really important whether you're making it or buying it that you want it to be unpasteurized. And like the miso master, um, that Hiroko mentioned is unpasteurized. And so that's really important because you can use these, these misos actually to further ferment things um, like vegetables or whatever, but you need those enzymes to fall all intact. So I like to look at traditional uses of any ferment to see, okay, you know, looks like miso soup was made, but they didn't bring it to a boil or miso is used in cooking or, you know, and sauerkraut in, in Eastern Europe is, is cooked and cooked and cooked. And so I feel like the, the knowledge of the, the people who were using these foods forever also is important. You know, we get in our mind that it needs to be raw for the probiotics, but I, I feel like we need to also be open to, to thinking about how they've been used to keep people very nourished through centuries. And science is now starting to kind of talk about that as well. We are seeing that um, there are something called paraprobiotics and postbiotics. And these are all parts of these ferments that interact with our system. And so miso, again, is just full of all of this, whether you eat it raw or cooked or not. Um, so we've got your enzymes, right? Very important. They denature somewhere around um, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, 70 um, Celsius. That's when you're gonna lose that action of your enzymes. Um, your actual live microbes, your probiotics, they've got a really low temperature tolerance. It's gonna be about you know, 105 Fahrenheit, 40, 41 Celsius you're gonna lose your probiotics. But does that mean you need to eat your miso raw? Of course not. Um, so paraprobiotics are really cool. I've also seen them called ghost biotics, but they are the cell walls, the dead bodies of those previous probiotics. Now, any ferment, whether you eat it raw or not, is going to have a bunch of, of these dead, dead probiotics too. And it's actually where the vitamin B12 is. It's where a lot of our nutrition comes from. And, and we're just now seeing that these, uh, the DNA and these dead microbes also have communication and connection with the microbes in our gut. And it's, it's all part of the picture. So I like to bring that up to say, you know, Yes, look at how they've been eaten traditionally and, and you'll, you'll get a lot of information about how you can play around with these foods in your own, in your own diet. Um, let's see, Is there anything else? Oh, I did wanna define postbiotics. It does always sound like that would be the dead microbes, but the postbiotics are basically the metabolites. Um, it's anything that the uh, microbes create in that fermentation process. And um, yeah, so as far as um, making your own miso, you know, 
it's a wonderful process. It seems super daunting. Um, and I think partly that's because it is, you know, in this country, it's a Japanese food. It's, it's semi unfamiliar anyway. And so I think it's daunting for people to just get started. Um, and it is more daunting if you're choosing to grow your own koji. However, if you, you can, go online, you can go to an Asian market and you can buy koji already grown onto the rice in a dry form. And once you're there, it's just a matter of mixing your koji, your protein, your salt, squishing it all together, putting it in a vessel of some kind and, and, letting, it, and letting it do its own work. I mean, that's kind of the beauty of working with fermentation is you've got all these little chefs in there doing, doing the work for you. So I think my time is up and I do want to, um, yeah, pass it on to Kyle. Before we get to Kyle, Kirsten, thank you so much. The amount of questions besides the 300 questions we got before that we kind of group, but just ask a couple of questions because they keep coming up. We'll just address it right now. One is people are asking about ratios. And I said, there's so many varieties. If you can, and the vessels, especially that vessel next to you with the rocks on it, people are asking about the medium, like what it's made of. So if you can just quickly address vessel and ratios, and then we'll get back to the rest. All right, so on vessel, I'm gonna, I plan to do this, but I, I wanted to make sure I didn't run out of time. So we've got a bunch of rocks in here. I've, I've boiled my little river rocks. And then I have a plastic bucket. I didn't, full of more rocks. So here we go. This is coming out. Now do you see that uh, coming off the bottom there? Mm -hmm. uh, that is, that's magic stuff here. Um, <laughs> let's see. Unfortunately, let's see. I'm going to try to kind of tip this, but I am going to show you. This is a tamari. So original tamari is the moisture coming up, oozing out through that fermentation of the miso. This, this is amazing elixir here. I mean, this is, this is all the flavor you can imagine. I don't want to lose that. And I'll try to let you guys look in there. So there's the tamari on a plate. And this is a um, cedar vat. So cedar is a very traditional vat that's used for miso. This one is, um, gosh, I forget. I think it's five gallons. Um, and I, like I said, I start with it full and then it, it just keeps shrinking the longer it goes. The flavors that the wood imparts, if you're committed to this, it's worth um, finding one of these. I think in the US, the only person I know that's making them right now is um, Quercus Cooperage on the East Coast. But anyway, the flavors from these wooden vats are incredible. And that's what I love about the real traditional misos is you've got this interplay with other elements as well, like the wood. So the other question was ratios. Um, that, is, that is kind of hard for me to answer like, what, my book, lots yes. of ratios. <laughs> the traditional right. ratios, um, like I said, some of them, okay, but I can't answer like um, on the salt, like, if you're doing a white miso, you're gonna do around a six to 8% salt, probably closer to 6%. With playing with low salt misos, you're gonna get a little more funky. You can play with it. You get lower than four, you're gonna get a lot of funky. Remember I said that salt is your controller. Um, you get up to these dark misos, you're gonna get up to um, you know, 16 to 20% salt. Mm -hmm. uh, yet they don't taste crazy salty. They, it, it all works out in the end and you use such small amounts. And in fact, I had mentioned that these are still sweet because you're getting the sweetness of that koji. This has lost the sweetness, but you've got like um, this depth that's pretty incredible. And believe it or not, one of my favorite applications for a hacho miso, I mean, I, I love it on everything, but one of my favorite applications is 
in a um, dessert application, like put a little hacha miso in a dulce de leche and you get this amazing caramely yum. So. <laughs> Well, thank you, Kirsten. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and passion and obviously lots of expertise. Uh, we're going to move on to Kyle next, who's going to show us different ways of using it um, traditionally and contemporarily. And uh, we'll, we'll come back with some questions after. So Kyle, why don't you take it over from here? Um, show us what you got. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, how, how are we doing on time, Robert? How? Because well, I know you'd like to get to some questions. So um, yeah, we're we're good to go. Take take the fifteen. We can go off. We can go more than an hour. We can go another fifteen right. minutes or so. I think I can Check. move um, through this uh, quickly as well. Um, so uh, this is great. Uh, Hirokusan is gave a really great um, you know introduction to sort of regional and different varieties, and that was an amazing presentation on actual. Um, you know, production of making of miso and see there's a lot of questions about actually making miso and a lot of really great, you know, things uh, um, uh, asking about um, uh, about, the, about the miso itself in the process. Um, I'm going to talk here at the end a little bit more about applications using it from a culinary perspective and uh, in particular at Single Thread how we use um, uh, misos in our cuisine. Um, which uh, is, we're, we're a restaurant in California in Sonoma wine country. We're driven by uh, my wife's now 24 um, acre farm and, and the varieties of vegetables that we're growing out there and, and our local terroir. But um, we do spend a lot of uh, time in Japan and we work um, um, at live there for many years and, and spend a lot of time working with various artisans and craftspeople all throughout Japan, uh, various artists, but also food artisans as well. Uh, and our nightly changing 11 course um, uh, menu is based on what's coming uh, from our farm, but does very much follow a Japanese menu um, format. And we do use a lot of um, uh, Japanese inspiration uh, in, in our menu. So it's kind of a blend of, of, of more traditional uh, Japanese cooking, especially from the Kansai area of Japan mixed with um, our local terroir of, of Sonoma and California uh, cuisine in which we use a lot of um, miso in our cooking and I think Hiroko-san did an amazing you know job just talking a little bit about the spectrum of miso and and we talk a lot about that with our chefs quite a bit um, all of the different types of misos um, and you know uh, I think a lot of people think well, it's just white miso red miso and then you, you're you kind of palate and, and understanding starts to uh, expand to all these other interesting uh, things hacho miso mugi miso saikyo miso um, all of these, uh, you know, various different things and different applications. And it's a really fun way to not only talk about um, uh, the cuisine in, in Japan and how it's influenced by these different misos, but to talk about uh, cuisine culture uh, in Japan and the regional sort of, um, you know, variations. And if, you, if you've heard the old brillant Savaran uh, quote from uh, now, you know, now over, you know, a century ago, he said, you know, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. And that very much uh, applied to miso uh, uh, in Japan. And that's changed a bit, but but has also stayed very, very regional. That different types of people in different regions based on their terroir, based on their conditions, based on how, you know, hot or cold or tropical or wintry, uh, you know, mountainous the um, area was. And, and then their jobs working as farmers or, as you know, on the other end of the spectrum, as the sort of uh, aristocracy in there, their misos were very, very different to reflect the differences in their diet and their in their lifestyle. And now we think about all these different things from a culinary perspective and how we can use them interchangeably. But you know, traditionally, it is very interesting to see how um, uh, different they were based on all of these factors that I just uh, that I just explained. So um, I'm going to share with you um, here a, a, sh a short sort of just image presentation that I put together of different types of dish and dish groupings um, of how we're using uh, miso at, um, at single thread just to give you some ideas of going you know well beyond just sort of miso soup which is what most people know miso soup miso ramen you know these sort of more traditional um, dishes here um, sort of showed uh, some um, other um, more traditional dishes and I'm going to show sort of where that tradition meets some innovation in a non-Japanese um, um, kitchen here so give me one moment as I share my um, share my screen uh, with you here. Um, 
All right, so hopefully you can see that as well. If there's any issues, Robert, please pop on and um, uh, let me know. But these are the few applications. Um, um, as I said, our, our restaurant and inn and 24-acre um, farm is in Sonoma County, California, so in the heart of Sonoma wine country. Um, we are driven by uh, the, the vegetables and the produce uh, coming from my wife's farm. As I, um, as I said, uh, we're not a vegetarian restaurant, but um, that the, the, the vegetables are the driver there this image here is the first course that you sit down to in the 11 course menu it isn't a menu that you order from guests give us information about themselves their dietary restrictions allergies aversion preferences and so forth and we create menus um, uh, for our guests sort of individually um, really that night and it begins with a uh, tasting a sort of view of today that moment in um, you know here in Sonoma from the floral to that she grows or gathers and to the various ingredients. So here, there's a lot of different mess, uh, preparations using miso, and we'll get into um, every single one of them. But I just want to talk, just show a little bit about the sort of diversity of how we're using miso. Um, so uh, Hiroko-san did um, talk about uh, Saikyo miso um, quite a bit. We use almost exclusively Saikyo miso in the restaurant. Um, and uh, this is, uh, as she pointed out, the sort of the miso of Kyoto. So. It's quite a long history. I won't go too um, deep into it, but um, uh, Kyoto being the old capital, the sort of imperial headquarters that where all of the aristocracy and a lot of the sort of wealth and the arts and, um, and government was, uh, they, the uh, people living in the Kyoto area, uh, you know, many of them were not living the life of a farmer or laborer or fisherman. Uh, they were, um, you know, uh, working, uh, you know, you know, running the government, running the um, you know, in, in various things in the, in the arts. And so their miso reflected a lot about their lifestyle. So Sakyo miso is a much sweeter, much more delicate, much very, very creamy, very sort of um, a light miso. And Hiroko said, I think said it perfectly, talking about bringing out the natural um, flavors of the, of the, the vegetables and, and the ingredients that it's served with. And that's very much how we use it. So while we're cooking here in California, our, our cuisine style in terms of all of our Japanese influences in our queen, cuisine is very aligned with Kyoto cuisine. That's where I get my inspiration. That is the cuisine in which I worked uh, in, uh, in Japan and, um, and is, is very much supports um, also what we're doing in California. So we work with the producer Hondo Miso uh, that's in Kyoto. They're actually the miso makers to the imperial family. We actually get small batches of um, miso from them that um, that does go, uh, you know, to the uh, to the household. Or, um, and uh, the, here you can see the Saikyo Miso and in the back you can see an aged Saikyo Miso. So there was a question that came up in the chat about aging white misos, um, that, that does happen sometimes at the miso maker or uh, we do it um, ourselves. So the, the Saikyo miso that we use is, it has a very light and sweet flavor. It is not the most umami of the misos, but to continue the aging process, you get this oxidization and a more depth of flavor. So where we would use white miso or into um, a, a red miso uh, more, uh, akamiso, we actually instead use an aged Saikyo miso and it tones that sort of sweetness um, down. We still get the refinement of that miso, but with the toned down sweetness. And these are uh, my friends um, at, uh, uh, at Honda Miso, the, the current owner and his son um, who, who was taking over the, the, uh, the business. Um, I, I won't go too deep into that. Hiroko san did sort of cover this, but it is a more rice based uh, um, uh, miso. Um, and, uh, you know, starting off first, these are more traditional style uh, dishes that we do. We do um, donabe hot pot, which is a big passion of mine. We do this more for our in guests as an in room thing rather than in the restaurant. Um, uh, serving these more rustic um, type of hot pots, but we do a lot of donabe um, cooking. So on the right is a Hokkaido style seafood uh, uh, nabe, uh, but with a saikyo miso. And then in the center and on the left is uh, a more a tantan nabe, which is for us is saikyo miso, but with also with sesame paste, uh, goma and uh, um, uh, mixed in there as well for more sort of richness and more depth of flavor. So these are more inspired by their traditional um, uh, dishes. And then sort of moving into sort of, sort of the non-traditional um, um, applications, you know, coming from this sort of soup and stew um, category. Uh, here on the left is a dish that we do from pea, with peas from, the, um, uh, from our farm, uh, peas and peas flowers and peas in their various forms. On the right, you can see a little bit of very, very soft yuba 
um, uh, that we've made. And then a pea puree, the soup um, that is just essentially the peas uh, that are um, uh, processed and pureed. Very, very smooth with uh, Saikyo Miso as really the only seasoning. So again, lifting the flavor of the natural flavor of the pea, enhancing the natural sweetness of the pea, bringing some saltiness and umami, but allowing that pea flavor to, to come through. Um, on the right, kind of a very similar um, uh, technique, but in a completely different um, season, obviously. These are um, pumpkins that we grow. Um, uh, we grow a, a number of different uh, Japanese heirloom pumpkins um, at, at our farm, as well as some of the row seven um, seed uh, pumpkins. So this is a roasted pumpkin um, soup again, roasted pumpkin that is pureed, seasoned with uh, um, uh, Saikyo Miso. And instead of adding cream and milk and dairy to this, that is giving it the creaminess, again, enhancing the inherent sweetness of the pumpkin, bringing in some umami, but not overpowering with it and becoming the salt um, of the dish as well. And that is ladled from that roasted pumpkin um, into this uh, cup here where we have um, Dungeness crab and uh, and uh, some roasted pumpkin and uh, toasted pumpkin seeds. So these are some sort of non, somewhat non-traditional um, soup techniques, not that pea soup and, and uh, pumpkin soup don't uh, uh, exist in, in, uh, in Japan. They are fairly common, but this is a little bit more of a, of a sort of new, new way of using uh, miso in Western cooking. Um, a big uh, area here is uh, seasoning sauces and marination. So I'll just kind of move through these dishes a little bit um, uh, quickly. Again, with the pumpkin, um, this is a, a vegetarian um, dish where we would do in place of a sashimi dish in the upper left-hand corner, um, where we do have uh, a pumpkin and uh, uh, braised kombu. Uh, and the puree of the pumpkin, a lot like the different um, soup, uh, completely uh, different style dish is just the puree of the roasted pumpkin with Saikyo Miso seasoning in and, and, and like I said, really enhancing the natural pump, um, pumpkin flavor. Down below is a sashimi dish we do with different um, varieties of tomatoes that we grow on the farm. So we have different varieties of tomatoes um, as well as uh, kampachi uh, sashimi. And uh, that broth uh, uh, on, on the bottom is, um, is just a, a, a thick, fresh soy milk um, that we make tonyu and that's uh, just seasoned with um, uh, Saikyo miso again. So a sashimi dish getting a really, really, um, and, and a little bit of the tomato water as well. So a sashimi dish, but um, a really cold tomato, um, tomato preparation and just getting it seasoning instead of having soy sauce and stuff for more heavier, darker, deeper flavors. Um, we have a very light sort of um, miso and uh, a soy milk flavor. Uh, in the center is uh, a duck liver parfait. These are um, duck livers that are uh, um, cured in, uh, in the Saikyo uh, miso, uh, rolled into torchon uh, and poached uh, here, um, served at the beginning of, uh, uh, of the almond blossom uh, and plum blossom season here in, uh, um, in Sonoma, but actually using it as a curing uh, medium. And people do that quite a bit with foie gras and with meats and different things is actually bury it in the miso and let that usually sit typically about three days and pull out some of the, uh, the, the water in there, bring in some of the seasoning and given it sort of inherent umami uh, to, um, uh, uh, to the dish. And then on the right, uh, this is also how um, the, the menu starts at single thread and a lot of um, uh, miso seasoning that's, uh, that's going in there. So kind of our salt in the kitchen is either using the, the, the Saikyo miso or using shiokoji. So um, uh, those, those are kind of our salts, our seasoning so, um, in the kitchen. Um, traditionally, uh, you know, miso is used for a lot of grilling and roasting, um, a lot of brushing onto meats and grilling to uh, sort of allow for that sort of char and burn and that natural uh, umami. Uh, so th this is a, um, a, a kind of more modern uh, take on a traditional dish called hobayaki. This is a hoba leaf, so it's a big um, uh, uh, sort of uh, leaf that's been dried. Uh, and in here we have a mix of the Saikyo miso and a little bit of a sort of creative, uh, more Western way we've done it is mix that with a, uh, a puree, kind of a, a butter made of, um, of hazelnut uh, and with um, uh, venison and sunchokes and different vegetables. And then that goes right onto the grill. So um, that the flame is coming out there, it's cooking and caramelizing the miso with the meats and with the vegetables. And then that as it caramelizes becomes the dipping sauce. And we brush it onto duck breasts and chicken legs and to 
um, uh, salmon and stuff as a sort of grilling medi medium to get that charred flavor, the smokiness to stick to the miso and to have um, uh, some nice Maillard flavors. Breakfast applications uh, here, a little bit more traditional, your traditional miso soup. Uh, we will adjust the miso um, throughout the year, depending on the weather. So depending on how hot or cold it is, we will adjust for our in guest breakfast, um, the, uh, the miso soup there. So, uh, you know, miso uh, in applications also can have a lot to do with the season. The deeper, you know, colder the winter is, the generally the darker and heavier and more rich um, that, uh, that it, uh, it becomes, uh, uh, the, whatever the preparation, the soup or the, uh, the stew. And in the summer when it's really hot and really humid, you have very, very light miso soup. So this is reflecting a, a, more, a, um, a, a more warm weather uh, breakfast, a Japanese style breakfast with some homemade tofu there, dashimaki, tamago, um, uh, rice and uh, different dishes, um, uh, salmon in, uh, in, in miso and and so a sort of light and more healthy way to start off um, uh, the, uh, for the Japanese uh, style breakfast. Again, a little bit more traditional style. Grain dishes um, at our restaurant, um, instead of serving rice, because we're, we're, not, uh, we're not in Japan, we're not a Japanese restaurant, we grow um, various grains, mugi and uh, different barleys and, and things. So instead of finishing the traditional Japanese meal as you would with soup, rice and pickles, uh, we finish with the grain, uh, grain dish here. So. Uh, here we have uh, mugi barley uh, that is um, uh, dressed in herb puree and saikyo miso along with um, some uh, uh, bamboo shoot that's been roasted, brushed uh, with saikyo miso and torched. Um, uh, once again, there's a little bit of, um, uh, of duck meat on the top of that as well. Uh, then in the center, this is more of a large uh, called kamado-san. This is a Japanese rice and grain cooking donabe, um, Japanese traditional clay pot. Here we're cooking the various grains. Here you can see with spring vegetables, um, lamb, morel, mushrooms, and everything has been seasoned here with, uh, with miso to give a nice creaminess um, uh, to the grain. Uh, and then finally, we have more of... Um, uh, of kind of a grain uh, grain porridge, very savory grain porridge with wagyu beef and uh, um, uh, matsake mushroom um, and caramelized uh, saikyo miso where we put the grains and the miso into a, a jar, put that into a pressure cooker with just a small amount of water and pressure cook that inside of the jar and then take the caramelized grain um, uh, out of there. So it, it reacts and, and caramelizes inside of the, inside of the, the jar under, the, under pressure. Uh, coming here uh, to the end, uh, talked a little bit about sort of dessert uh, preparations, and I saw that there were some questions about uh, dessert and ice cream applications. These are three different uh, uh, desserts here at different um, times um, um, of the year uh, using um, saikyo miso in the ice cream. So a very, very sort of lean uh, ice cream base uh, so that we can have a lot of flavor expression um, of there um, and sort of finding that balance between getting ice crystal formation and um, uh, without ha having too much fat, uh, too much richness um, uh, in there, like I said, for the flavor release and Saikyo Miso um, uh, into that. So we just love it just straight up, um, you know, not cooking the miso into it all, mixing it into the, the ice cream base and, and, and gives you a credible texture and creaminess and sort of like elegance um, uh, to the ice cream. And you can see the spin that you can get in, in, in that ice cream because of the creaminess that the, the miso and the formulation has um, given you. Uh, and then lastly, these are some more dessert applications uh, here. There's quite, quite a few, but we have some miso and apple custards. Um, here are some um, chocolates that are filled with ganache uh, done with, um, with Saikyo miso. So Saikyo miso and the ganache making a smooth ganache and while it's still warm, actually blending in the Saikyo miso to that to bring a little bit of saltiness where you might add a little bit of Malden salt to something, but also a little bit of umami depth uh, to that as well. And then more of a light and refreshing one on the left where we have the yuzu ice. This is kind of kakigori uh, inspired um, uh, dessert here with a uh, underneath uh, the yuzu curd with a little bit of uh, Saikyo miso. So, so anyways, those are just, Kind of a couple of quick um, uh, ideas of the applications um, of uh, of misos at uh, of uh, Simfred. Just just a few quick ideas, chef. Oh my of, uh, goodness! <laughs> That's beautiful. That food looks incredible. Quick, um, just whip up 
But, um, yeah, yeah, I know. This morning it just popped them out. <laughs> um, but seriously, um, some beautiful foods, some interesting insights of how you're using it. Um, I just want a couple questions to you, then we'll open it to the group. We still have a couple hundred people on from around the world. So people are listening. And so we can stay on for a while. There's no hard stop um, at the moment. But one thing for you that you didn't address here, a lot of people are asking is miso and beverages. I've only done it in like a Bloody Mary type of thing. Have you done many? Because you, when you do the pairing with your meal, it's how many courses? I mean, I remember 13 different yeah, 11, beverages. 11, 11, 11, yeah, with my wife got not even non-alcoholic folks. So do you ever use miso in beverages? Yeah, well, we do a non-alcoholic um, beverage pairing as an option. We have, you know, wine and wine and sake, uh, you know, pairing um, options in there. And we do a non-alcoholic ones, uh, um, which we have um, a team as part of our culinary team and the sommelier team work together to craft these beverages to actually pair with the dishes individually. And, you know, it, it's definitely come up and it's something that we've done because we're doing it in a pairing and we're usually have dishes that have maybe a lot of umami or salts or sort of richness mm. to it that the, oftentimes for us, the beverage side is more to counterbalance that. Um, right. So it's not something that we do um, a lot, but I do love, um, you know, blended beverages in there. I do especially like with sort of dairy you know, based mm. things as well, or various like nut milks, because I think it blends so nicely into there, um, you know, into that or with the tomato purees. And so I think there is a lot of different applications. I don't know that they're as good pairing wise, because the it's bringing so much to it. So it's kind of mm. can be a little bit of diminishing returns in terms of having, you know, too much going on. But I think standalone, mm that there's a really great opportunity for, for, you know, small amounts of miso uh, in, uh, in, in beverages. Right. Okay. So um, I know Hiroko-san, you need to leave shortly. You've got somewhere you need to be and we, we understand that. So you can do that. A couple things as we post in the chat, uh, this entire recording is going to be online as all the webinars have been. So you can look back. Um, I'd like to ask a question to the group as a whole and we can, if you can come back on, that's fine. And I think uh, Kirsten, you may have a lot to say about this is people are asking a lot about the nutritional Right. And I know when I first learned to use me, so I didn't heat it till I think what past 140 or something like that. But is there a temperature that changes and kills the things that are benefit? Yes, Hiroko san. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. Uh, so we'd love to hear a little bit about the nutritional aspects of it. And, you know, there's a lot of benefits, the microbiome in this, but how much are you getting out of miso? So temperature, quantity, and just overall effect of the nutritional qualities of miso. Yeah, I'm not an expert at this because I think there's just so many ways to approach the traditional qualities of miso. Um, mm. But yeah, so temperature, you're right. You know, not heating it over that 140 is good. You're going to get those enzymes. Now, I did see somebody said something about why do we care about the enzymes in our body? Um, Enzymes, like I said, are, are little snippers. They're cutting things up and, and breaking things down. And so we need that in our body. We need most of our foods to be broken down into a form that's more bioavailable to us. So consuming enzymes in our foods helps our stomach. It's, it's gonna help our own digestive enzymes. Everything's like, that's what we're doing here is we're trying to break it down, break it down, break it down. So that's hmm. one of the places. Miso also has an incredible amount of probiotics. Um, they're going to stay alive, you know, if, if you're having it more raw. Like definitely in the ice cream, you're going to get it raw. I like to do salad dressings with them when I want it raw. You know, you're going to get everybody. Now, there's always the question of, well, once it goes through your system, right? You, you know, it's got to get past your stomach. With most ferments, even if you're eating the live probiotics, most of them don't get through. They don't make it through alive. Some do, and many are transitory. So eating miso for health benefits, yes, you're getting probiotics and, and, and all of that and enzymes, but I think the health benefits go much deeper than that. I think it's just a, a soulful, nourishing food in so many ways, you know, the way it's produced, the way... Um, the, the microbes have worked on the food um, and all of that. But I also know that there's been a lot of studies. I mean, that there, 
we don't we don't fully understand our the, the world's traditional foods and how they nourish us and how they're healthy. Um, but if you look at miso, there's a lot around um, with, um, you know, with freeing our body also of radiation and things like that. They, they did things, you know, in pans with Hiroshima and that whole time period, understanding it and then back again um, with, uh, oh, it's slipping my mind, the big one in, in Russia, <laughs> uh, you know, with, with the nuclear power plant and, and how the MISO was helping people recover. And so mm. again, the science is out there. I don't have any of the studies, you know, in my head offhand, but, you know, there, there's supposed to be a lot of reasons to eat it just around kind of helping your body get rid of free radicals and, and the antioxidants and, and all of that in miso are incredible. So I think it just, it's one of those foods that if you can figure out ways to just add it in, I think I saw somebody ask about eating it daily. Um, I think a lot of people do eat it daily and I think it's right. to eat daily. Right. You can eat it, you know, in some of these wonderful applications, you can put it in your food, but, you know, sometimes in the afternoon I will, literally just have a cup of miso, like a cup of coffee. You know, it's a little pick me up. It, it's healthy. It, it feels good. It's warming. Um, so yeah, there's lots of ways to get it, get it in there. <laughs> Great. Also, I would recommend to the group because we can't address it now. By far, the Japanese are some of the most prolific in scientific papers right, in publications. And so I'm sure there's some things about this specifically about the nutritional science behind it. So I'd encourage you to look online and then share with us on the Fermentation Association's Facebook page and things like that. We'd love to hear. Kyle, any comments on the cooking aspects of it, health benefits? I mean, some of it's just holistic. It makes you happy. That's healthy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't speak to, you know, to the science of it. And there, there's a lot of technical, um, you know, questions here. And uh, <laughs> you know, I really couldn't, um, you know, speak to uh, either the nutritional science, in, uh, you know, aspects, um, you know, of it or actual sort of, uh, you know, temperature thresholds for enzyme activity and killing and everything like that. That's uh, not my um, area sure. of specialty, but I think it is a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, thing is, is really trying to understand the actual sort of like science behind, um, uh, you know, the, the, the health uh, benefits and definitely leave that to the nutritional, um, you know, scientists, um, you know, like, like I said, a lot in our cooking is, is, um, you know, we are, um, uh, you know, using, I think, um, miso in places, and I don't want to say replacing, uh, you know, other things to try to create some sort of analog, but um, as I said, is this kind of like removing a lot of the sort of like the the the, the salts um, in the cooking or the dairy or in, in using not only the sort of flavor benefits but the sort of textural you know attributes to give viscosity and and things and you know we don't set out to be a you know a health food restaurant or fine dining restaurant um, but we uh, you know we we try to do that with. Um, uh, in a way that isn't so, you know, decadent and trying to change the face of sort of what dining has been, which has, you know, been about a lot of sort of, um, you know, unhealthy, you know, sort of eaten, eating or sort of gluttonous, you know, eating. And, you know, miso has been a really an amazing sort of tool for us. And, and I've seen for a lot of other Western chefs where, you know, they are consciously, whether they want to or their guests want to, can reducing you know, butter, cream, you know, these things, you know, from the diet, um, you know, cheese and other areas. I see a lot of chefs turning to, uh, you know, turning to, to miso to give them that same sort of creaminess, richness and viscosity, which is a lot what we do now. So it's interesting to see a lot of the sort of, while a lot of our cooking comes from more traditional um, Japanese cooking, I think it's really interesting to watch chefs who do not come from a traditional Japanese sort of cooking um, background into their cuisine, still right. using miso into you know, dishes and changing dishes, more Western dishes, more European based dishes and, and, and starting to, to use these ingredients to sort of lighten, make more healthy and to get a sort of better flavor impact with smaller portions. Right. Hey, Kyle, question for you. So um, from a chef's perspective, I mean, you've been, you know, you're in Japan a long time ago and you've worked in a lot of fine dining, but you've also worked with the larger restaurant groups. And so you, you, you're looking at the whole swath, not even though your restaurants, you know, fine dining. Do you see, as you just alluded to, chefs using it in new ways that um, 
that you hadn't seen before? Is it becoming more common? Is it is the market saturated? Is there going to be still is there still a lot of room for more chefs to use it? I guess is one of the questions. And how on a more mainstream sure. level, not just the finer dining restaurants. Sure. Well, I think it's becoming pretty ubiquitous in people's kitchens now, and people did not have know that much, or they just you know only knew miso soup, and they only knew you know shiro miso ako miso. And now with a lot of these resources that, you know, some of our panelists are, here are creating, there's a lot more information, you know, out there. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest for, you know, from, from chefs of creating their own misos and have definitely spend a lot of time doing that. Um, you right. know, it, I think it has been a really great creative outlet for people to be trying different mediums and, uh, you know, to create their, their own misos. At what point does something, you know, sometimes a conversation at what time does, at what point does it stop becoming, you know, miso and turn into something else, um, you know, was sort of addressed there <laughs> you know, as well. And I think, right. you know, making something unique and creative that goes into your cuisine and helps you develop, you know, fl a flavor profile that you're looking for and, and perhaps to a more nutritional profile is a really interesting, um, you know, area to take that as long as you're taking it safely to try to recreate a superior miso, traditional miso from that that is being made for in Japan in a certain, you know, environment. And if you go to visit these, you know, environments, you know, the one thing that you struck with right away is, is what a sort of, you know, a habitat for the, you know, the flora and everything that's going in the microflora. Right. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a quite intense, you know, place and, and people kind of are a bit struck by what they see as a sort of cleanliness, you know, of the place, but it's a very specific sort of environment. So to try to make what someone makes better, uh, you know, for me, I don't believe in, I, I, I go to the best miso maker, you know, that I fi find, of, I feel, and I buy the miso for them because that's their area of specialty and mine is being a chef and using using it in the, in the applications. But it doesn't mean that I don't think that there's something interesting. I think chefs and food companies will continue to innovate you know, new ways and new directions to go with this, because I think there are benefits that come bef well, way beyond creating a trendy dish that you can say, you know, chickpea miso or, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, green pea miso or something, uh, you know, pine nut miso or something, you know, that there really is, uh, you know, there are actual benefits to helping in, you know, in our efforts to sort of change, you know, for better food systems. I think this is going to be a really important area. And I think everyone who's here watching and just reading through the questions before this, I, th I feel that this, this group is very, very plugged in to that and really mm -hmm. thinking about that. And I think I was very excited by, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the questions and the comments that I'm, I'm seeing here is, is that there's, there's a large group of people very plugged into that. Right. Well, yeah. And I, I, go ahead. Yes. Kirsten. I was just going to say that, I mean, kind of just to, to go off of what Kyle was saying, I think the other place that we're seeing it in, in kitchens too is um, trying to, you know, manage things like, um, you know, maybe they have a bread, a bread baking program in the kitchen and now they've got leftover, you know, stale bread and making the miso, these amino pastes or even, you know, soy sauce type things out of the protein that is the bread. So is another interesting way that these pastes are, are kind of making the way into the kitchen by the kind of recycling and full utilization. So I just think it's right. another interesting way they're going. Right. And if you think about it, you know, all soybean paste came from maybe arguably 6,000 years ago in Shandong, China. That's where tamari, I mean, everything came from someplace and is a mix of everything. So better is a subjective experience, Kyle. I agree with you. There's no better. There's different. It's an opinion, different. right? It's just different. And yeah. um, good food is good food. It doesn't need to be labeled as a cuisine. If someone cooks something, if it tastes good, it's nutritious and it feeds your mind, body, and soul. It's good food. And miso helps with that. So I'd like to turn it back to Amelia for a moment for a couple final questions. We're going to wrap up here in a few minutes, folks. I know some of you just had an hour, but this has been incredible. So Amelia, just a couple last questions and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, all of you mentioned there are a number of different type of misos. We had a few questions about what is your favorite miso, Kirsten and Kyle? What do you guys like cooking with the best? Uh, I think I kind of covered in my presentation. I mean, I we we do use um, you know sort of a, a, in single thread cuisines, so not necessarily my own you know like uh, life outside of uh, um, of that, but. 
you know, my, uh, we love to cook with the Saikyo miso. And like I said, to get different effects of it, we age it for different periods of time or have the miso makers age it for different periods of time to get different attributes of it. And I, you know, I, you know, I, I love that for, for our cuisine. Um, but for eating, you know, to myself, uh, just something that I really love to sort of like eat and snack on is, um, is the Mugi miso. I love the texture. I love also, I'm passionate about more sort of rustic Japanese like farm uh, style cooking. And I love that type of, uh, uh, the, of the Mugi, uh, you know, miso in there to have that, like I said, more of those textural elements. Kirsten, what do you think? What do you like? I mean, lots of it. I don't, yeah, I don't like to limit myself. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with Kyle just on my own. A lot of times if I'm having, you know, just some miso, it's the Mugi miso or maybe a red miso. Um, but I think with cooking, I, I really enjoy the hacho, the real deep, dark, dark and moody misos. <laughs> right. Excellent. Well, folks, there's so much dialogue. That, and it's true, Kyle, I'm really impressed with the chat. And folks, there's so many different avenues out there, which people are sharing on here. So I encourage you to stay engaged, come back to the Fermentation Association. We're just getting started. We've got years ahead. And we hope that you're all part of it. I'm honored to be uh, part of the organization and uh, part of this esteemed panel, at least moderating it. And Amelia, I'll let you wrap it up. But thank you, everyone, for coming, participating, and engaging. And we hope to see you in person one day soon somewhere. Yes, I am going to put in the chat right now. I know we didn't have time to get to everybody's questions. Uh, I just put in the chat all our speakers' social chat, their Instagram handles, and their website. You are free. They're readily available if you have extra questions, you want to reach out to them. Um, before closing, I also wanted to let you know about the Miso Day celebration on September 18th. Uh, this is a celebration for miso makers and importers that are collaboratively working together to bring attention to just how easy it is to incorporate miso into daily recipes. Um, thanks to all of you for attending our webinar. Thanks to Hiroko, Kirsten, Kyle, and Robert. Uh, we will post a recording of this webinar on TFA's website in the next 24 hours. We also have a number of great webinars coming up in the next few weeks, including launching a fermentation brand, fermented dairy and health, our fermented foods probiotics, and the new definition of fermented food. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and to register. And while you're there, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Be well. Have Thanks. a good one.